Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater here with Run Blog Run. This is your favorite program, Socialing the Distance. Today, we have a real treat, Alicio Punzi, Road Running Manager for World Athletics. Alicio, great to see you. Hi, Larry. It's been a long time indeed. Pleasure yes. to see you. Are you in Monaco? Currently, I am, yes. Okay, okay. Now, where do you normally, where do you live? I live, let's say, in the region here. Technically, it's Italy, so technically, I cross two national borders every day. From okay. Italy into France and then into Monaco, but it's only a 40 kilometers bike ride away. Oh, cool. Yeah, I used to, when I would come in, I would stay in Menton and okay, love that area. Yeah, yeah, so it keeps fun. So today we're going to talk about the um, gold, silver, and bronze labeling with World Athletics. With all the races in the US, there's a lot that don't take advantage of the program. And I wanted to give you a chance to explain how it developed why it's a great opportunity. And, and I'm very curious about the challenges, which I, I, I'm doing a, uh, a world athletics labeled race during the pandemic. Um, so tell us how, the, how long has world athletics been doing the labeling, the, the, uh, the gold, silver, and bronze series? Well, the uh, world athletics, the then IWF label for race, it started in 2007, 2008. Okay, and and it really was a, a bit of a foot in the door for World Athletics into the road running road running industry. Uh, prior to the 2007, with the exception of the you know obviously the Olympics and the World Championships, we didn't really have much of a presence in the open road running scene, if you wish, an invitational road running scene. And as a matter of fact, the first World Athletics Road Running Commission, IWF Road Running Commission, was even created in 2007. So. One of, the, one of the first initiatives that this group came up with uh, was this label road races series. And uh, right from the from the onset, it really wanted to be two different things at once, uh, both a quality recognition scheme for road races, as well as a categorization of road races from an elite competition standpoint, a sort of you know Diamond League continental tour of sorts for road races. At the beginning, there was just one label, only the gold label. Then, the, then they became two, and then over time, we reached a system in which four different labels were needed, from the platinum all the way down to, to bronze. As a matter of fact, Larry, in 2021, and as you will, as, as we will soon uh, see in the, in the 2022 regulations that we're about to publish, we won't have the, the traditional hierarchy of platinum, gold, silver, bronze. We'll probably discuss that later when you ask me about the challenges of the program and how we are trying to adapt it. But yeah, mm -hmm. the program is, is these two things at one. It's a certification scheme for road races, both in terms of quality as well as sporting relevance for the better, for the lack of a better expression, as well as a calendar of races. The, to qualify for the different levels is, is it, um... Would it be correct to say you are recognizing the the higher levels of professionalization of some races as opposed to others? Well, yes and no. When it comes to the elite race, definitely. Uh, clearly, an event that has a better quality elite field will always have a higher label than an event with a medium level elite field. But there are plenty of very well run super professional races that currently, at least with the current regulations, aren't part of the series because up until up until now, really, yeah, we're looking to change from 2023. But up to this very moment, races need to have a certain elite competition to qualify for it. So take the example, your American audience will have plenty of examples, but Marine Corps Marathon, fantastic event, certainly yeah. right up there with the best of the best. It never considered getting a World Athletics label because the People's Marathon never really never really had prize money, if I'm not mistaken, never really had an yeah. international elite race. And that is absolutely fine. It's not that an event without a label uh, is not, not, not a good enough event. What labels do, at least now, is telling a, a race that matters from a sporting significance point of view, from a race that might be a beautiful uh, competition experience for participants, for citizen runners, but doesn't have that elite race element. Because at the end of the day, uh, this is what, what World Athletics uh, does. That that is the business we're in, telling good from from better, and categorizing races, categorizing athletes, providing pathway for Olympic and World Championships qualifications. These are all 
purposes that the label racist program helps serve. You're going to announce tomorrow at, uh, you have a webinar tomorrow at um, 2 p.m. Central European time, which is 8 a.m. New York time, um, 7 a.m. Chicago and 5 a.m. in California. Uh, and, and we will have the link up uh, today um, on our site. Um, the uh, um, a, some changes since this is not going to be uh, posted till after your event. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what what the changes are going to be about? The 2022 program will be much similar to the 2021. The changes that I would like to highlight are the 2021 versus previous editions of the program. Now, okay. the labor racist program, much like the the professional, the international professional running scene is predicated on the fact that, that you have uh, races worldwide and athletes from all over the world and elite athletes from country A is able to compete in country B, okay? This has been the case, thankfully. This has been the case for pretty much forever, since at least since the a professional distance running scene exists. We had races in China that had uh, elite field made of uh, athletes from, from East Africa. I mean, you had races in, in the USA with Japanese elite athletes, and that was fine. The system that gave races labels was based, based on that ability of athletes to, to travel and compete freely all over the world. So when the pandemic struck, a couple of things happened. The first one was that races really had uh, other concerns, and in some cases also financial, financial difficulties. They weren't going to put as much money as they normally would do into into the elite race but more crucially especially in, in certain parts of the world including the us travel was restricted in some cases heavily restricted in some cases just impossible plain impossible to travel in so a system that will tell you you want to have a platinum label you have to have at least five athletes five men and five women coming from the top cohort of the sport and 95 percent of them are from east africa if you are the New York Marathon or London Marathon, maybe you can do that, but many races are just um, unable to afford that. And uh, let alone the fact that in some, in some jurisdictions, in some geographies, China is a good example, but along with China, that is downright impossible. So we changed and we developed a, a simplified system that on the one hand, um, granted, granted um, long-term stability to the program, kept the program alive because Labels still matter a lot to races, and we might we might discuss that later. Uh, on the other hand, uh, simplified life to, to race organizers and made labels attainable. While we did this, however, since World Athletics is mm. first and foremost the governing body for, for the elite sport, we also came up with systems to keep funding, keep incentivizing, keep uh, financially supporting uh, elite races. So in other words, with the exception, there is a label currently. There is a label that you can get without any commitment to races, but there are two, two labels that you can only get if you commit resources to elite sport, either by having a race at home or, and this is one of the novelties for 2022, by um, contributing financially into, into what we have called uh, distance runners, elite distance running solidarity funds, mm -hmm. which is a way through which races and, and sponsors and partners willing to support elite, elite running and, and to have a world athletics recognition for that, namely a superior label, an elite label or a, an elite platinum label can do so. And then world athletics together with the athlete representatives and with the contributing races, determine how this money is, uh, is best spent for the benefit of, of athletes worldwide. It should be stressed, Larry, that world athletics is making absolutely no profit whatsoever from the labor racist program. Okay. Conversely, the administration of the program is still funded with, with, with revenues coming from other activities of the, of the organization. And uh, if you want more details about the anti-doping program, that is a, an integral component of, of the labor mm -hmm. racist program, World Athletics is contributing annually by 450,000 US dollars, specifically for specifically into, into road races. So it is true. The race organizers are contributing financially to create this integrity program, which is mainly um, out of competition testing of athletes, intelligence, monitoring, and, and education. But World Athletics is still, uh, is still 
contributing substantially to the to the existence of that uh, of that program. Hey, we work with a group over here called Road Race Management, and we keep a updated list of everybody who has been mm -hmm. popped for doping, so that some of the moderate races don't get these guys coming in, men and women mm -hmm. coming in who shouldn't be there. And uh, so I, I really think what you're doing on the anti-doping front, especially, is important. I wanted to talk about the challenges that we've had with the pandemic. Um, how has that um, made it harder for for world athletics to put on road races? I remember when you did the half marathon uh, in Gdynia, the, the world half, that was incredible that you were able to do that successfully at the, really the height of the, the pandemic. Um, what are you telling race directors about um, the hygiene safety that they need to do? I mean, Berlin just did a race with about 25-5 um, and, and it seemed to go over. And I just had a press release today from Vienna that no one tested positive from the, the city marathon. So that tells us that what the, the uh, LOC at uh, of Vienna did, they did correctly. Um, what are the challenges? Larry, it's a very, very broad question. Let me start by saying that within World Athletics, yes, my job title is road running manager, but I'm mainly in charge with the non-championships event. So my job is mainly relationships with race organizers such as sure. Berlin, more than it is um, organizing, staging our property, our, our own road races. It's been said, yes, I can share a few, few thoughts on uh, how difficult it has been to organize world championships in uh, times of the pandemic. It certainly was a challenge, also a financial challenge, because the the things that you need to do are cumbersome enough in normal times. You can imagine how many extra layers of complexity uh, respecting pandemic, respecting health and safety protocols in a, in, in a pandemic era has uh, added. It is crucial, though, the willingness of the the country that hosts the event to really push through and to make it possible. So this is what happened with, with Poland. The, the Polish government, the city of Gdynia, and all the people involved were absolutely um, willing to do the event. They were absolutely supporting the event and they were really ready to pull at every stops to, to make that happen. Now, talking about invitation or races, um, what do we tell them? Well, not, not much really, because it is not our role to design overarching international health protocols simply because they have very little relevance within the, the, the national realities of the countries. World athletics or any international organization for, the, for that matter can design beautiful guidelines, but if these guidelines are beyond what is accepted within a particular jurisdiction, they, are, they really are of, of, of little use. For our own championships, both road and, and stadium, we do have these protocols because they are developed knowing what the country regulations are. So if we know that there will be an event in Poland and the situation in Poland is expected to be X, Y, and Z, then we can work with it. Mm -hmm. Again, we have a dedicated health and science department uh, that has done a terrific job on, um, on this very topic. But when it comes to invitational races, label or no label, um, be, beyond cherishing what they do, beyond helping in some cases with helping them lobby their governments to, to make sure they get the permissions to happen. When it comes to the technicalities, to the practicalities of uh, health and safety protocols, we don't really, we don't really do anything. Um, in the case of Vienna though, mm. um, to give an example of one of the things we do, when Vienna was trying to, when, when, when the organizers of the Vienna Martin were negotiating with the city authorities and tried to explain why it was so important that road races should come back, we helped them with their lobbying. We, we provided them with, with data, we, with reference to studies, all pointing out that, that the direction of uh, it is safe, it can be safe to stage uh, mass participation events if you do it properly, especially in countries like Austria, where the vaccination rates are that high. But also at the same time, we really want to, and this is a, 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 an inherent world athletics function, we are here to help race organizers worldwide explain to their national and city authorities why it is so important to stage road races, why it's important to stage mass participation events. The pandemic has left not only huge holes in, uh, um, in the debt situation of many countries, but also has created incredible health, mental health problems 
and uh, you know more people than ever need need to keep fit the importance of of being of being fit of being uh, healthy is never has never been more understood than it is today and running can definitely help that help there we, we help race organizers make the case with their national authorities with their respective authorities it is important though as you pointed out that this mm -hmm. event come back because if a big event like the vienna marathon or the berlin marathon go ahead successfully with no but not with no contagion with no cluster then it's considerably easier for someone who's, who's coming who's coming next to say look this event had twenty five thousand participants vaccination rate in the in the country was x in our country we have a similar situation we are in a similar phase of the pandemic and these are the economic and social benefits that you would get that we as a community would get if the event goes ahead now what do you do you cancel the event or do you help us do you let us yeah that's a tough one the um what we're seeing is races are coming back uh numbers in the 5k are going up 10K seems to be growing. Half marathon and marathons are at a, at, at a good place. Um, and it seems uh, the over the next six weeks, we've got London, Chicago, Boston, New York, and uh, several other marath European marathons, Rotterdam in there as well. The, the fall is going to be a, a crazy marathon time. Do you see that after the pandemic, things will go to a fall and spring season? Or are we gonna see people staying with the fall season? What, what's your gut telling you right now? From conversations we had with race organizers, most of them for 2022 are looking at returning to their usual calendar slot. Not okay. all of them, London Marathon, as you know, will, will still take place in October, but you know the majority of, of races We'll get back to 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 start to status quo, assuming that the conditions of the pandemic allow. What, what should, why? Because there is only so many runners worldwide, and so many runners in Europe, so many runners in one particular country. So if you have, and we're seeing this, if you have ten big, expensive, more expensive to organize marathons taking place in a in a limited time span, as a matter, inevitably there will be fewer customers. The market will will shrink. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody likes that, right? Also, yeah. because it's more expensive than, than before to stage or races to stage any mass participation event. So, I guess um, we will return to a situation. Talk to me about your um, webinar tomorrow. What are you mm -hmm. hoping people will get from it? A couple of things. Uh, first, first we have. An interesting, interesting presentation from Nielsen Sports, which is our research partner. In April and May, they did, together with World Athletics, a study into recreational running. Uh, they focused on 10 countries. USA is one of them. Mm -hmm. And there will be a few. The, the sample was pretty high. We we're talking more than 5,000 people surveyed. So the data do have some, uh, some uh, validity. The focus is on pe people's motivation for running. Mm. As a matter of fact, the the title of the session is really providing providing runners motivation to run. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, it's, it's a consumer research. So we will certainly yep. understand what consumers, what running consumers are looking are mm -hmm. looking for, and what the trends are uh, in this post pandemic phase. Then, in the second part of the webinar, we will have Brett Clothier, the head of the Athletics Integrity Unit, which will who will explain the evolution of the dedicated road races integrity program as mm -hmm. you might remember larry uh, in late 2019 we attached to the labor road races program a very important it's probably its centerpiece that is this auto competition testing program that that i mentioned no yes All races are now contributing to that program and effectively by participating to the label program races can really show to the sponsors to the runners to their governments that they are putting their their wallet where, where their mouth is when it comes to keeping the sport good, you know? good. so brett will explain how basically how the money has been spent right uh, brett and i really wanted strongly wanted to have this session because you know, races have contributed and it's just the right thing to do we explain them in detail what the money has been spent for but also how we have changed 
our plans on the go, how the AU have changed their plans on the go when the when the pandemic struck and for example it, it became impossible to test in certain areas or it became uh, no longer no longer um, economically um, meaningful to to test athletes who didn't have many opportunities to to compete so how that has been adjust, adjusted mm. and then the third part of the of the webinar will be me explaining how the 2022 labor races program will work you know, applications mechanics rationale what to do if this happened how you apply what are you expected to do so a very technical technical session on the on the program itself overall a couple of hours i do hope that your uh, that your readers that your viewers that your followers can can tune in even if they are not race organizers the first two sessions at least will be very interesting very if you are an athletics fan a road running fan give you a bit of an idea of uh, one of the main initiatives going on in the sport mm -hmm. so yeah hope to see you online great the um, what we're we're finding in north america is participation is up about 30 percent in running and that there are a lot of new runners and mm -hmm. so we're hoping that as we come out of the pandemic we'll be able to keep those people involved, educate them about the sport, encourage them to, to you know, find their own way, find their way in racing, um, whatever level that is. Um, is that what you're seeing in Europe? Definitely, definitely. Um, I guess that this Nielsen Sports Study will also shed some light on that, on that very topic. And uh, already last year, there have been studies both in Europe and, and the USA that, that I'm aware of mm. that really highlighted how a number of, uh, of, of athletes and a number of runners take, took up the sport after the pandemic. Why? Because two reasons, really. One, it was, very, it was one of the few sports that in certain areas you could do. There were restrictions, but at least you could go for a little jog around the block or for a little run on the, on the play or on the park, wherever you lived. Mm. Also, uh, and many people struggle with mental health, so running is a perfect answer to that. It's a perfect way to address that problem. But also, Larry, you've been you've been doing this long enough to know that whenever there is a financial crisis, people turn to to running. Yeah, yeah. one of the yeah. if you remember the two hundred eight credit crunch, one of the effects that that, that we could see after that was that the second or maybe it was the third running boom happened. People were running because why? Because it was the most affordable sport they could do. They had time. In some cases, people were out of jobs, had more time, had less disposable income and, and, and running they did. Yeah, I, I recall one of the questions that we asked at the time and also uh, during the pandemic is why they were um, interested in running and they, um, and why they got into it and they said it was one of the few things that they could control in their lives you know yeah, and yes. um uh, i i think that the one of the things that that i've been very happy that world athletics has embraced and encouraging citizen runners is the idea of bringing down anxiety health and just a general sense of well-being you know r running and walking are, are are very key and it gives people an appreciation you know walking their four miles a day or three miles a day and then seeing somebody run a marathon um and, and they're going oh my gosh you know and so i think there's that appreciation of it too um one of the things that has been challenging uh in track and field and in um race walking during the pandemic has been the lack of crowds on courses do you see as the pandemic opens as the pandemic changes that local rules about hygiene will allow people back on courses again well it's not first and foremost it's not a matter of allowing because if the event takes place on the public road and people can walk freely in the streets of their city they can really show up we've seen at the end of 2020 and still in 2021 that race organizers are trying to discourage spectators from from showing up showing up um, on the marathon courses, because I guess this has been one of the friction points when negotiating uh, permits with uh, with health authorities. Mm -hmm. Race organizers could very well and did very well 
guarantee that you know this is the protocol for our participants this is the protocol for our volunteers but how do you control spectators right so yeah yeah you don't that's why valencia marathon last year london marathon next week they are encouraging people to watch the race from uh, from the comfort of their homes they're all big marathons broadcast on tv Sure. It's been said, will people return to the streets? Well, it depends. If, if they're interested, they, they will. I don't know if you're into cycling, Larry, but there were the UCI Road World Cycling Championships last week, and there were an estimated 1 million spectators lined up on the, on the roads in Belgium. Wow. Okay. For the men's race. And if you, see, yeah. if, if you watch TV, they probably were 1 million people. Yeah. Was that, was that a bad thing from a public health perspective? I don't know. Not, not for us to say, but... If people are free to to move, to travel, to be within their country, then you cannot really stop them from showing up uh, and shoot for their family at the race. Um, coming up in 2023 is going to be, I believe, the first World uh, Road Racing Championships? 24, Larry. 24? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, and and uh, is, or, or is that still a little too early? in the the uh, um mm -hmm. the the, the uh, presentation stage no with pleasure the event will be in riga love the city capital of uh, latvia not to be confused with other baltic state latvia yeah and uh, the road running championship is an evolution of the world half marathon championships okay. the half marathon will still be the centerpiece of the event together with a 5k road race these are the mandatory races that each event organizer, each championships organizer will have to provide, will have to set up. And then moving forward, um, organizing committees have the option to add other championships races on the road based on their local preferences. Okay. Cool. So the cool. event, which is, it is really cool. If the event is in Japan and there is appetite for a road relay for an Nike, then feel free to do that. If the event is, I don't know, in New York and, and they want to do a street mile or championships, more than welcome to do that. Or a 10 milers, 15 milers in other in other American cities, there is always uh, a possibility. Uh, it is currently a biannual event taking place every two years, but given the very high interest, there are talks about making it an annual event. Wow. For the 2024 edition that Riga got, there were 13, 13 expression, serious expressions of interest, which then turned into six actual bits, right? And when you do, when you have that kind of appetite mm -hmm. for an event, it probably bears the question as to whether it should be an annual event. Uh, it really speaks volumes of of how interesting mass participate, how interesting championships with a mass participation component are for cities, in that not only do they benefit from the you know, image, publicity, and uh, visibility that World Championships give them, but they feel hotel beds, they feel restaurants, they uh, attract tourists in town. So increasingly, uh, city tourism boards, uh, convention convention bureaus, and all these kind of entities that wh whose job is to attract people in town, mm -hmm. and events with a strong mass participation component. And uh, we're really working hard to give them exactly what they want. I recall being in Copenhagen in 2014 and enjoying the elite race and then watching 30,000 people. And I remember talking to Jakob Larson about it too. And I think he told me up to that time, the most they'd had is nine or 10,000. It just went crazy. And uh, I think that's when World Athletics, you know, then IAAF said, wow, you know, this is a great idea. And I, I think it's fantastic. I think the way of no bringing, brainer. yeah, to bring people in. Um, the um, I wanted to go back again to the the the, um, the the labeling program. What is the is there a basic cost for races to apply for um, the um, to to be selected as, as a uh, um, uh, to be in the World Athletics uh, Road Race Program? There hasn't been until uh, 2019, from 2020, given that we have launched mm -hmm. this uh, anti-integrity program of mm -hmm. the competition testing and education of athletes, we introduced what we call label fee, 
but they are they are extremely low. So for a basic labor, you're looking at thousand a year, or a half marathon, or a ten k, and then two thousand for a marathon. Okay. And I, I'd like to stress, hundred percent of this money goes into athletics integrity unit. Mm -hmm. the, and then um, for, for new races, I mean, it's not the case. For new races, where the athletics might choose to appoint a, a an international technical official to help them with comply with competition rules and with um, labor regulations based on how experienced the, the organizing committee is. So if you have, you know, if you have a race that has been in existence successfully for 30 years, we are not appointing anyone, most likely. The event is new, but really wants a label. We might want certain guarantees. And by seconding uh, World Athletics official to the event, we get those guarantees. But yeah, the costs are, costs are really limited. And then there is a basic uh, uh, number of in-competition drug tests to do as well. But again, you're looking at, for the entry level label, you're looking at three men, three women to test. Mm -hmm. So again, not, not a modest. In uh, One of the things that has been very successful during the pandemic has been um, the streaming of uh, broadcast of track meets, whether big and small. Some have been better than others. Um, is there going to be a protocol from World Athletics about suggestions for covering uh, mm -hmm. road races and a, a level of professionalism, or is that something down the road? Well, Larry, not for 2022, but there is an idea that we, we've been playing with. There are a number of races, forget about the huge events, forget about the London or the New York sure. Rams. They have fantastic coverage, but more, more crucially, they have distribution deals all over the world. There are a number of races that, you know, they have a decent, in some cases, good or very good TV production, mm -hmm. but they're not visible beside, they're not visible beyond, you know, beyond their YouTube channel or beyond their regional or, or national sure. broadcast. So one of, one of the things that we would like to do from 2023 is to, and this would be in the this will be discussed at the, at the webinar tomorrow as well. Is to give races the opportunity to provide the opportunity to to give to World Athletics TV rights for any unsold markets, and we will package them package them all together nicely. Provide at our expense English commentary because a number mm -hmm. of, a number of events take place in, in countries where English is not the first language. And then make them available either on our YouTube channel or on some some OTT platform. There. No, that's fantastic because it's Definitely. just uh, well, one of the things that I truly enjoyed um, during the uh, 2019 um, indoor circuit was how they were showing some of the meets on Facebook, and I was watching the amount of kids that got involved, and you know, it, it was uh, that's. The the big thing I remember from the uh, Breaking Two broadcast with Elliot Kipchoge, I was in Doha at the Diamond League meet, and I stayed up all night, and was we had about two hundred seventy five thousand people commenting on it, and virtually everybody was under the age of twenty three, twenty four, and it was new people so enthused, and what it told me was that in doing that, and then in, with World Athletics coming on in nineteen, and what they did. It was brilliant, you know, and I, I think that it's a way to capture uh, road racing. And, I, you know, I, I really applaud, uh, Alicia, what you guys are doing. I mean, I think it's truly important. Uh, we will promote the webinar um, today and get that out there for you. And then will the, once the webinar is done, will you save a recording of it so we can uh, post that out there for you too? Yes. Now, okay. the webinar is done in conjunction with uh, Mass Participation Board. Chris Robb, former Singapore Marathon organizer, sure, uh, has this Mass Participation Education uh, business, and the full recording will be posted on the Mass Participation Board YouTube channel. Excellent. And posted by email to all participants. Well, Lisa, you've survived me this morning or your evening, and I know it's been a long day for you, and I really, it's great seeing you. I think the first time I met you was <clears throat> at the Boston Marathon, and then I would see you, you know, at uh, different races. Houston races. Marathon. Which Houston one? Marathon. You said, Houston okay. Marathon. You're right. Okay, yeah. Some elevator in Houston, if I'm not Yes, mistaken. it was. It was. Yeah. Thank you. Alicia, thank you so much. Uh, we have met with the manager of 
road running at World Athletics today, and we're talking about a seminar that is tomorrow, uh, the 29th of September um, at 2 p.m. Central European time, which is 8 a.m. New York. Um, it is uh, 7 a.m. in Chicago and lovely 5 a.m. in California. And yes, you just got to watch it before you go out for your run. But Alicia, thank you so much today. Stay safe, my friend, and I hope to see you on the road soon. Likewise, Larry. Big pleasure to see you. Take thank care. Thank you. Stay safe. Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater, Run Blog Run. This is your favorite program, Socialing the Distance. Today, we were with Alessio Punzi. He is the road race manager for World Athletics. And uh, he's speaking about a, a webinar he is having tomorrow, the 29th, which we will be posting on Run Blog Run. Uh, about the changes in the World Athletics Road Running Labeling System, which is a program they started um, in the last several years, and it is continuing to evolve. The idea is to professionalize races, big and small, with big elite fields, small elite fields, but also to keep them on an even playing field, include, in, in, uh, especially around the whole anti-doping area. Um, and to share information, which is one of the great resources World Athletics has about participation, uh, sport hygiene, um, challenges in, in racing, um, sponsorship, all those things will be there. Um, Alicio, I've known for several years now, met him in Houston in elevator at the Houston Marathon. So that had to be, gosh, somewhere between 2012 and 2016. And um, he travels in a non-pandemic year, he's everywhere. Um, and he tries to spread the good word of participation and that World Athletics is there to help grow the sport. Um, one of the things, the two things that I was most interested in was the anti-doping platform that they are introducing um, in road racing, which is really important because what happens is the dopers will show up at these small races, pick up some money. And uh, really one of the few things that was out there with our friends, Phil Stewart and Jeff Darman at Road Race Management, uh, we helped sponsor for several years. Uh, it was a list, a current list of all the people who've been banned from racing because you'll get people that'll come in and, and take advantage of, of the hospitality of uh, a community and a, a road race. Uh, the second thing that I think is really important is spreading the good word about racing through um, modest streaming video showing showcasing the races. And World Athletics is working on a program there too. So I think those are really good things. And I need to applaud World Athletics for putting money where their mouth is. Um, we will get some posts up today uh, to tell people about this event. And um, we uh, encourage everybody to watch it either live or uh, we will have it up on Run Blog Run. But uh, this is Larry Eater with Socialing the Distance. We were talking with Alicio uh, Punzi today. He is the road race manager for World Athletics. This is the epilogue to the Socialing the Distance where Larry, of course, spouts off on things he knows about and things he doesn't. Stay safe.